صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي in the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, we ask Allah to send His greatest peace and blessings upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings He has given us. And the greatest blessing being that He allowed us to be of the ones who remain steadfast, dedicated, and loyal on the path of our Master after the Prophet, the Commander of the Faithful, the Prince of the Believers, the Protector of the Prophet and His Message, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing and every blessing for without Allah we would have nothing. Assalamu alaikum my dear respected brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, yesterday for those who were not here, we dived right into the discussion of identity and talking about what it means for us as American Muslims, particularly us, our community. What does it mean to have an identity? And what kind of identity do we look at, not just from a theological perspective and our belief and our creed, but from a sociological perspective? How do we see ourselves when we look at ourselves in comparison to everyone around us? Do we use our differences when we observe one another as a point of division and a point of allowing ourselves to distinguish and differentiate so that one can say that they are better than the other or one can be in a place of judgment to mistreat the next person? Or is it merely that it allows us to look at commonalities and that Ahlul Bayt taught us that no matter what human being you may come across, you have a commonality in identity with that person. Yesterday we briefly covered the idea of the four spheres of identity. The four spheres of identity being the core, the main, the first, that we are followers of Ahlul Bayt from a sociological perspective, from a social perspective. As followers of Ahlul Bayt it makes us distinct within Islam. But at the same time, we have a sphere of identity that goes immediately after that. The second sphere of identity being Islam itself. That we belong to this faith, our religion, just like every other person who believes in Allah and the Prophet Muhammad And after that, the third sphere of identity being that we are monotheists, we are believers in one God, like our Christian and Jewish brothers and sisters. And finally, the fourth sphere of identity being the identity of humanity. That at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Even if someone does not share in the belief that you have, does not have the background that you have, does not have the creed that you have, regardless of faith, creed, color, or race, we are human beings at the end of the day. And no human being is better than the other, except by the judgment of God, and the judgment of God comes through the lens of piety, a taqwa. And that was established for us by the narration of Imam Ali alayhi salam in letter 53 of Nahj al when he directs his appointed governor in Egypt that you are to treat people one of two kinds, either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity. That means what? That you and I, my dear brothers and sisters, we are to treat one another as brothers and sisters. Meaning what? We care for one another more than we care for our own selves. If you are a part of a family, you know that a true family looks at one another and puts each other before they put themselves. Your priority is to take care of your sibling before you take care of yourself. To take care of your mother or your father before you take care of yourself. Now if we are brothers and sisters in faith, applying not only to our own school of thought, but to the entire religion of Islam, then that's the way we need to treat one another. And then if we don't belong to the same religion, be it individuals that share with us in the third sphere of identity, or even the fourth sphere of identity, 
another monotheist, or simply another human being, that other human being is your equal. I am not better than you, and you are not better than I, or you are not better than me. If we take this, my dear brothers and sisters, this inspiration from Ahlul Bayt السلام, where Imam Ali السلام, was moved at seeing any injustice done to any human being regardless of their faith or school of thought, regardless of what affiliation another person had, Imam Ali السلام, was there to help them. In this holy month, in this month of rediscovery, in this month of reform, in this month of change, we need to tell ourselves, we need to look ourselves in the mirror and see who we really are. Do we see who we really are? Inspired by Ahlul Bayt السلام, our identity should be clear from your creed, from your belief, from your religion, and your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and your mere existence as a human being. Your identity should be clear. And that identity should give you strength in dealing with others in compassion and mercy. Now tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to focus a little bit on the idea of community. What does it mean to be a community? And why is it so important that we look at the idea of a community? Is it okay for us to simply live our lives in a way that's isolated? Or is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in a way that we are social beings, that we rely on one another, that we look to one another for comfort and support, that we look to one another to build, to develop, to advance ourselves, that an individual cannot be successful in his life if he does not put his hand in the hand of his brother or sister, that an individual cannot be successful in this life or the next life, if he does not care, keyword care, for the plight of his brothers and sisters, wherever they may be. Where Rasulullah told us that if an individual, if an individual hears someone calling, O oh Muslims, O oh Muslims, and he does not answer that call, then he is indeed not a Muslim. When we look towards one another, my dear brothers and sisters, especially in this holy month, like I mentioned yesterday, this month is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us, no matter where we are in our journey in rediscovering ourselves and bringing ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I speak to myself before I speak to you. I remind myself before I remind you, no matter where we are in our growth, Shah Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for reflection. Taking the narration of the Holy Prophet where he tells us that an hour of reflection is worth more than 70 years of worship. Imagine that. Merely reflecting for one hour is worth a lifetime of worship. What does that tell us? That tells us that in order for us to grow, in order for us to advance ourselves, we need to reflect. And one of the things that we need to reflect on is our state, our position within our community. When was the last time that we extended our hand to help somebody else in our community? When was the last time that we thought about not just a member in our community, but specifically our neighbor? Our neighbor, regardless if they're Muslim or non-Muslim, regardless if they're a believer in God or not. There's a beautiful story where and Imam al-Hasan decided one night to observe his mother Fatima in her prayer. As Lady Fatima السلام, being the daughter of the Holy Prophet and not only being an honorable, noble individual and the greatest woman to ever walk this earth, not merely because she was the daughter of the Prophet but because of who she was as an individual and what she chose for herself. Lady Fatima السلام, was that example of perfection for all of humanity, not just women, but for men and women alike. And Imam Hassan السلام, at his young age, he decided he was going to watch and observe his mother Fatima during her prayer throughout the night. So from the beginning of the night to the end of the night, to the very beginning of the morning, he watched his mother pray. She wouldn't sleep. She just prayed. 
Finally, when her prayers ended, he went up to his mother Fatima and he said, My mother Fatima, I've watched you throughout the night. I've listened to your whispered prayers. And I heard you. Not one time did I hear you pray for yourself. Everything that you prayed for was for other people. Everything that you prayed for had nothing to do with you in your own person. Lady Fatima السلام, would smile and look at her son and say, My son, your neighbor before yourself. Your neighbor before yourself. Now, how many of us really take that and implement that in our lives? You see, my dear brothers and sisters, we don't necessarily need to go into the depths of theology and philosophy to drive lessons for ourselves to see how we should live our lives. Of course, it is a noble endeavor for one to study and look deeply into our faith. But the beauty of our faith is that even in the simplest concepts, in the simplest principles, we can derive inspiration. We can lead noble, honorable lives. Look at that story, your neighbor before yourself. Lady Fatima Ali Salam was teaching her son, who was only about six or seven years at that time, maybe even a bit younger, that you have to put other people before yourself in order for you to be successful in this life. That if you wish to be a servant leader, if you want to be someone who is going to be leading in the community, leadership in the community does not mean that you're simply sitting at the forefront or standing or walking, leading at the forefront. Leading means that you are providing for people, serving people, there where people need you. My dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran that He has created us as tribes and nations so that we may get to know one another. Yesterday we began the discussion of diversity and having different identities merely by being one who has an origin in one place in the world or has a citizenship in another place in the world. What does that mean for us? As believers, as followers of Islam, is it fine for me to be from one part of the world and have citizenship in another part of the world and be a practicing Muslim? Quite bluntly, is it, is it something that is natural and does not come in conflict to have an American and a Muslim identity? Some people may tell you that to be an American and to be a Muslim is not something that can coexist. You're either American or you're a Muslim. Or that you would need to sacrifice or compromise from one identity to the other. And that's simply not true. Because the beauty of our faith is that this is a faith that allows you to live and thrive wherever you may be in the world. And that in fact, not only will it allow you to live and thrive for yourself as an individual, but you will be able to contribute to your society and your community in a better way because of your faith, because of your integrity. Because Lady Fatima alayhi salam teaches us that even if you're in a neighborhood with nobody that believes in the same belief that you do, you still have to think about them before you think about yourself. That is what our faith teaches us. So wherever we may be in the world, as American-born Muslims, or immigrants to this country, or immigrants to any other country, Islam allows us, Islam enfranchises us, empowers us to be members of our society, to be members of our society that are productive and contribute to that society. Don't let anyone ever come across and tell you that your belief in Islam, your identity in Islam, you as a follower of Ahlul Bayt, limits you. It doesn't. For us, the sky is the limit because we have the teachings of Ahlul Bayt where even at times when we may feel that we are the lowest of the low, that we may feel that we are being belittled and that in fact we are little and that what we give is little and that where we are in life is little, is nothing, is insignificant. Imam Ali salam tells us, and you might have heard this hadith before, You think you're an insignificant entity while within you lies the greater universe. That as individuals, 
as believers in this faith, as human beings. Imam Ali alayhi salam tells us, never feel discouraged. Do not be one who looks at himself and sees insignificance. Because if you're holding on to the rope of God, you are limitless. If you're holding on to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and the potential that He has for us, then really the sky is the limit. And the love of Imam Ali alayhi salam sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. أعيد الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد. And the third time in love of our holy prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه محمد وآل محمد. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the idea of community, what do Ahl al-Bayt tell us? Imam al-Sadiq عليه السلام on a number of occasions, he would tell his followers. Go to the mosques, pray in the mosques, visit people in their homes, attend people's funerals, visit the ill ones, be there for people. You cannot remove your hand from the people because if you remove your hand from the people, then you lose many hands while they only lose one hand. Our affiliation with our community, each and every one of us, a community is made up of what? It's made up of individuals, families, organizations, groups. All of those come down to the individual. If each individual decides for him or herself that I want to contribute, I want to be part of a whole, and I want to be part of a whole in a positive way, then that community is going to be a beautiful community. That community is going to be a positive community. That community is going to be a successful community. Now, many times, brothers and sisters, we look at one another and we say, why is it that our programs or our mosques are empty? Why is it that the centers are not doing enough? Why is it that the community itself is not doing enough? It's an interesting question or an interesting series of questions. Many of us have these questions, have these contemplations. One thing I would do, from my humble perspective, is that Learning from the inspiration of Ahl al-Bayt tells us to start with ourselves. Imam al-Sadiq tells us that do not look to examine others. You should start with yourself. When we want to see why is the state of our community, whether looking at it as a whole perspective, very broadly, or more specifically at certain centers, institutions, groups, organizations, families, homes, what is our contribution to that issue? What is our contribution to the situation? What are you and I doing? In this holy month, again, take it as an opportunity. What are we doing in this holy month? Now sometimes, and I'll be quite frank with you, I had a conversation with a few brothers and sisters regarding the programs at night. And one one brother told me, why are you guys having the program after iftar? And I told him, ask Sheikh Ilal. I'm just kidding, Sheikh. I said, well, what do you suggest? He said, why don't you do it before iftar? And I said, okay. But you know, previous years, there was a program before iftar. And then people said, why are you doing it before iftar? People are so tired. Why don't you do it after iftar? Okay, so you do have to have that. Essentially, the idea is what? If we want to find excuses for why we're not doing what maybe we think we should be doing. Not to say that, for example, if someone is not attending a certain program, or a program in general, that means they're doing something bad. It's merely that they're not attending. So why are they not attending? There can be any excuse and any justification. There could be any excuse and any justification for any issue that we may pose. Now let's be honest with ourselves. If we wish to do something and to be a part of something, a part of a growth, a part of a process, then we will be a part of it. If we don't want to be, then we simply won't. Just like, for example, when you look at the movement of Imam al-Hussein and the movement of Imam al-Hassan, 
There were individuals that went up to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam when he decided to have his peace accord with Muawiyah. And they went up to Imam al-Hasan and they told him, we want to revolt against Muawiyah. Imam al-Hasan would patiently listen, smile, be kind to his followers. And he would tell them, you are our followers and our admirers. But I'm of a different opinion than you. And this is the decision that is coming from the divine. Now, how do we engage with one another? Even when we have differences in opinion, regardless of programming or not, we as a community, when we have differences in opinion, differences in perspective, how do we engage with one another? Do we write each other off? If, for example, you follow a different scholar than I do, or you go to a different mosque than I do, or you come from a different village than I do, which has its own set of issues, and by default, you supposedly have different perspectives because geographically you came from somewhere else. How do we deal with that? How did the Prophet himself deal with that? The Prophet was an individual who surrounded himself with so much diversity, you would see the rainbow around him. The Prophet himself, during his movement, he would have people that were former slaves that he freed. He would have individuals that were from Quraysh and not Quraysh. He would have individuals that were from the northern part of Arabia and the southern part of Arabia. He would have individuals that were from Arabia generally and from Persia. These things, let alone, let alone being from outside of Arabia in general or having a former slave as being one of your closest companions, being Bilal al-Habashi radiallahu an, just having someone from northern Arabia and someone from southern Arabia was bizarre. The Prophet made it a point to not only show people diversity in color, he also made it a point to show diversity between the genders. That he would go on to marry an individual, that his first wife, the first love of his life, Khadija السلام, the one who was there for him in every moment of grief, in every moment of struggle, in every moment that would be a challenge to the Holy Prophet in his journey, in shedding that mercy, and giving that mercy to mankind, there was Khadija. That it would be said, and history would echo, that if it were not for the support of Khadija, and the sword and the guardianship of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, Islam would not rise. Those were the two that Imam Ali, Ali that the Holy Prophet would depend and rely on. There was a community just amongst those three. And from the principle that they all shared, they would allow people through their open doors to join that movement, to join that progress and that journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what color your skin is, it doesn't matter what village you came from, it doesn't matter what history you had. Many of us brothers and sisters may feel that I've sinned way too much, that I have a history, I have a past that is so disgraceful. Why would God ever accept me? A person told me once that I've sinned so much. God will never forgive me. God will never look at me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. And to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that do not lose hope in Him. Even if you lose hope in yourself, do not lose hope in God. And if you think about it, if you don't lose hope in God, then ultimately you cannot lose hope in yourself. Why? Because you are a creation, an effect of the ultimate cause being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I believe the might that He has, being the might of all things, that source, then I could not, I could never lose hope in myself, no matter how low I may feel. Do you think you're insignificant while within you lies the greater universe? That is the inspiration that we have, my dear brothers and sisters. But it has to be, it must be, something that stays in connection and association with the community. Because without a community, without that relationship, we can lose touch. And that is why it's so important for 
for us to be reminded by these sayings of the Holy Prophet and Imam al-Sadiq reminding us that we need to stay in touch. We need to connect with one another. Even if, and I give this as a simple recommendation, and I'm going to try to do the same thing in these holy nights. Let's go through our phone book. Let's open up our phone book. Tonight, tomorrow night, and these next coming nights. And go through your phone book, or you know what, go through your Facebook list, or your Instagram list, or your Snapchat list, or all of them, and start getting in touch with people. Not sending them a Snapchat, or not sending them you know, another picture on Instagram, but get in touch with them. Salam, hi, how are you? How you been? How's the family? Ask people how they're doing. I have an individual who I was just looking through my phone book the other day. I swear, I texted this person, I haven't talked to this person in years. And I just said, Salam, hey, what's up? How are you? How's the family? How are you doing? How's school work? What are you up to? He appreciated that so much. And then he started talking to me about how out of touch he's been with everyone else. And that, that mere message that I sent him, because I decided that one day to just go through my phone book and see who I haven't talked to in some time, that meant the world to him. He said, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We would be surprised to see how these small acts, these small acts of kindness, and by pushing these small acts of kindness forward, how much it has an effect on other people. When you're walking down the street and you see a person asking for help, give that person help. Give that person help. Reach into your pocket. Don't be like those individuals who Imam Ali reprimanded for not helping that person simply because they look different than they did. Reach into your pocket and give. One of the greatest feelings, one of the greatest feelings that a human being has, and this is simply psychologically, is when they give from what they have to someone else. That feeling of giving is so rewarding. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good about that. Not patting yourself on the back for, look at me, I did something good. But that feeling that I can take from the blessings that I have and share it with other people. That is a community. That is a community. When we think and care about one another. So inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters, I ask that we can use that inspiration and take from what Ahlul Bayt provided for us in thinking about one another, praying for one another, caring for one another. These principles may sound simple may sound very basic, but believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, the state that our community in, and the state of every community needs these basic principles, needs for us to remind ourselves, because before you want to move a community in advancement, in development, on the highest levels, in organizing ourselves on the highest levels, sometimes we just need the basics, and we need to just look at one another, smile, give each other a hug, take care of those that are less fortunate, and help elevate ourselves because there are many of us that are experiencing a low that you probably didn't even experience before or you probably are not paying attention to. So let's pay attention to one another. I thank you for listening and I ask you to pray with me for all of those that need our prayers tonight and every night. And the last of our prayers, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa afdul salatu wa taslim ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala al-bayti tayyibin al-tahirin. Oh, so...